All right, we are live. I'm excited to dive in. We have uh, Victor Zhang, the CEO and co-founder of Alpha Wallet, which is owned by Songbird, which has an interesting backstory. And you're also working on another project called Alchemy NFT to sort of paint the picture of the different projects that you've run in the past and then what you're most excited on. Uh, let's start with Alpha Wallet. I, I think that's probably the best place to start. Is that where you largely got your entry and interest and traction, both personally and professionally, in crypto and, and blockchain? And then tell me what Alpha Wallet is is really good at and what their state of the company is. Yeah. F- first, uh, thank you very much, Mike, for inviting me to the show. It's a great honor. So, uh, Alpha Wallet is uh, one of our first product. So when we start a company, we actually uh, start building two pieces of technology. One thing is this uh, alpha wallet. Uh, the other thing is uh, this uh, tokenization framework, or, or you can call it a token interface. Uh, that is uh, called a token script. Originally, we named it as a token behavior markup language. But after all, we think it's, um, it's not a sexy name. So we change it to token script. So the reason of... Uh, uh, building this uh, tool thing will help to, it's kind of like a long story. We need to explain our background and also uh, what is our vision is and then why we build these things. So so we have three co-founders. Uh, so for me, it's uh, more on the business side and the other two co-founders, they are more on the tech side. And one of my key co-founders is the current CTO. So we meet in early 2017, and uh, he successfully uh, sold his uh, vision in blockchain to me, and then we just uh, confirmed want to do a startup in this space to enable uh, the vision we both believe in. Uh, that is uh, tokenization vision. So basically, we can use blockchain technology to tokenize any type of uh, treatable rights. And after you tokenize those treatable rights, first thing is uh, it goes into a frictionless market, easy to easy understand. It's uh, you can trade it, transfer it peer to peer, without the uh, without any uh, intermediaries to remove the friction. So it's uh, more easier to form a frictionless market. The other the other thing is uh, not that easy to understand, but it's also very important. So after you tokenize a treatable rights, it it, it serves. It, it becomes like an integration point. Uh, so each token, you can think of it as an open API, and that is uh, controlled by user, not controlled by the issuer, not controlled by the centralized platform. So this will lead to a change. Uh, currently, all the integration is happened on the big centralized integration platform, like a, a v, uh, WeChat in China, Alipay in China, uh, Facebook, Google, those big integration platform. All the services integrate to those platforms and then provide it to the to the users. But we see there is opportunity uh, with the tokenized the treatable rights. The integration will happen on the consumer side. Can I pause you and and just ask quickly what is when you say treatable rights? What's an example of that? When uh... it's anything related to a person, uh, and it's, uh, the ownership is uh, transferable. For example, okay. if uh, if if you describe something in a way that uh, I have, like I have money, I have this glass, I have this pen, I have this picture, I have this uh, data, I have uh, whatever thing. And that thing is uh, transferable. Uh, it's, um, then it's uh, considered as a uh, treatable rights. And uh, also people may may call it as an asset in, the, in, finance, uh, in finance terms. But, but, but it's a very broad coverage, not only finance related treatable rights, for finance-related treatable rights, then it's uh, considered as I said. There's also like a non-finance-related treatable rights. Oh. Mm. And uh, for non-treatable rights, that is uh, like uh, uh, my identity, uh, my driver license, my passport. So these things you will never transfer. So my passport cannot become your passport. You, you, you won't change ownership of it. Then it is uh, still a rights you can use across different platforms but it is uh, non-transferable. If it's uh, non-transferable, then there are 
other type of uh, cryptographic technologies you can use to tokenize uh, those rights, but uh, you don't need to use blockchain uh, to tokenize those uh, non-transferable tradable rights. Got it, got it, got it. So it's, you'd be uh, primarily, so you're really concerned with all the transferable rights. So this is effectively everything that a person can own. Yes, like uh, my car, my money, you know, mm -hmm. all those, uh, all those uh, different type of uh, uh, tradable rights. This is uh, this is just an angle for us to 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 abstract uh, everything out to easily understand what is the fundamental benefit of uh, using blockchain and what is the fundamental uh, utilities it can provide. What is the key benefit? Because if you're looking everything from a tradable rights angle then we are able to explain everything in the same language. So we don't have to specifically looking at uh, like a DeFi. Uh, they, are they are just a type of tradable rights. Uh, for NFT, same, they are just type of tradable rights. On the blockchain, it's uh, just a, it's a, it's a programmable open ledger. You can record any kind of ownership. That means you can record any any ownership of a tradable rights, any kind of tradable rights. And on the mm -hmm. same time, you can use, uh, of course, you can use smart contract to define the transaction rules. It's like uh, if uh, if uh, the ownership changed from me to you, then what is the condition? What is the rules need to be followed? Or if uh, if uh, if I if I transform this uh, type of tradable rights to another format, then what kind of rules it need to be followed? Like if you lock your ETH to transform ETH to DAI, uh, to generate the DAI, uh, those uh, the USD stable coin, then what kind of, of rules do you need to follow? So those things can be defined by uh, can be defined by smart contract. But mm. fundamentally, like uh, uh, what is uh, what is a, a DAI uh, representing? It is uh, representing a. Uh, 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 equal value in the fiat US dollar amount, and that is the uh, right is uh, represented. And and what was the what was the pitch that got you excited? So uh, your partner came to you in 2017 and said, "Hey, Victor, the future is going to be one in which all of the physical transferable products that we have around us, physical objects, are going to be represented on chain and transferred on chain." What back then and and even somewhat today, there's it's unclear, at least in my mind, how exactly that works for smaller items or items that aren't necessarily um, beneficial by being on chain. Like if I you know sell you my headphones, it's like, well, do you need an on chain? So so first thing is uh, it's, it's it's not about the physical or digital. It's uh, it can be any type of uh, tradable rights. Mm -hmm. uh, physical product or physical services is just uh, one type. So another thing is uh, we need to understand what is the fundamental benefit of tokenization. So uh, as I, as I mentioned, one one thing is uh, uh, form this uh, frictionless market. Another thing is uh, provide a limited integration. So so these are like the features. So the benefit for having this uh, frictionless market that is uh, highly increase the liquidity of this uh, tradable rights. If it's transferable, then by removing the friction, then it's uh, easier, more easier to, to transfer than before. Then that means on the other angle to look at it, you can thinking as uh, it increased the liquidity. And liquidity is one of the key thing for the fundamental value of a tradable rights. So that means by having this, uh, by removing this uh, friction, uh, it's a uh, kind of uh, increase the fundamental value of this uh, tradable rights. That is one thing. And the other thing is unlimited uh, integration. Uh, that means the, the tradable rights itself may not be only used with the issuer's system. For example, I, uh, I, as the event organizer, I issue event tickets to you. And then you can use event tickets to, of course, in, in my own system to attend my events. But on the same time, because it's, uh, the, 
the this uh, verifiable information is opened up, is become is uh, tokenized, then that means uh, all other third party services can easily verify this information on a peer to peer basis. So they don't need to do integration with the event organizer system. So this enables the possibility of all the service market. Previously, for example, previously, if you want to provide service to a WeChat user, then you have to sign like an integration agreement with a, with a Tencent, and then they give you an integration permit on a certain level. Then you can provide certain services to WeChat user directly. If you are an insurance company, uh, by, by having this uh, integration permit, you will instantly become like a 100 times bigger because you, you are able to access to all the, all the, all the users. So, but after you tokenize those rights, then the decision whether, whether a user wants to use your service is purely uh, based on the user side. So there's uh, no longer a gatekeeper. So by, by doing this, it's uh, have a possibility to have a limited service provider to provide service uh, to you based on this uh, tokenized rights. Then come back, that means the, uh, for the token issuer, when you tokenize the, uh, the, the rights you tokenized, now have a potential to be used in a limited amount of services. Okay. Uh, adding a lot of uh, utilities. And just, just so I'm on the same page here. So this, what you're describing now, this tokenization product, this is not, is it, it how is this connected or is this alpha wallets initial concept? Uh, or are, are you describing more of the products uh, of, of alchemy NFT? Um, the, I want to make it's sure. The, it's the same. So our vision never changed. It's always the same thing. So, <clears throat> so to enable this uh, this uh, tokenization vision, uh, we need to decide what we can contribute to this vision. Because we see these things uh, will definitely happen. It's just uh, how it happened and how we can be involved. And to 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 enable these things, we identify. There are two key areas we can contribute. One thing is uh, no matter uh, what kind of uh, blockchain based application or, or what kind of uh, uh, tokenized, tokenized uh, rights user want to use, they will always need to have a powerful user agent. Uh, currently people call it a crypto wallet, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's not only like a finance wallet. It can, it, it can perform a, uh, uh, it can be used for other uh, functions as well. So that's why we make this uh, alpha wallet. It is a programmable uh, blockchain wallet. And currently it is the largest Ethereum uh, open source wallet with over, uh, sorry, my Siri come up. One sec. <laughs> you want a guest speaker? <laughs> every, time, every time I say Ethereum, it's uh, the theory come up. <laughs> so, yeah. so that is sorry, the, you were saying you guys are now, uh, what's the scale of the, of the alpha wallet now? It's, uh, it's not, it's uh, in terms of uh, how many uh, projects is using our code base in terms of how many fork numbers, we are the largest uh, open source wallet for Ethereum, open wow. source mobile wallet for Ethereum, but not, not saying we have the most amount of uh, consumer. Because uh, Alpha Wallet have a quite different uh, growing path. So we didn't really focus in on the consumer side very much. Although we do have the Alpha Wallet uh, branded APP in both iOS and Android. But, uh, but more importantly is the Alpha Wallet code base. Uh, so currently have uh, over 300 folks and there are more than 30 uh, live mobile application uh, is uh, based on our code base. Wow, interesting. And so, the, when you say you weren't focused on consumer, was the initial and and today even the approach to go B two B, where you're allowing other apps and companies to utilize the wallet, uh, or how how did that business approach go? 
it's a it's 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 like a two way. Uh, we are more focusing on the open source wallet itself, the open source code base itself. We treat it as open source project, and at the same time, we still maintain this uh, uh, mobile application uh, for consumer to use. Because, uh, because for me, I don't see uh, right now is the right now people still uh, users still more treat the, treat uh, crypto wallet just as uh, asset management tools. A majority of the users are still just uh, crypto investor and uh, speculators. So they don't really use Wally for other functions. Mm. That's uh, mainly for holding their asset, transfer their asset. And a few of them are using some uh, dApps through Dapp Rosa. Um, can I ask you something? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, when you build a wallet, you're holding the private keys on behalf of the users, which is kind of the benefit of the wallet, right? No. No. The, no. the wallet, the, the alpha wallet, um, it's a non-custodial wallet. So that mm. means uh, it is a standalone software. So there's uh, no, almost uh, no backend server. We do have some server, but that is uh, more like uh, for providing index service for, for people to easily tracking those price or those things. But for mm. private key, that is uh, uh, stored on your own device. For example, Alpha Wallet is the, is the first wallet utilize the uh, secure enclave, the on device secure enclave mm. um, on your iOS that is uh, uh, using this, this, the same thing which is uh, secure the Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. But we did some uh, trick because uh, Apple not allowed you to, uh, to, to, to access the secure enclave directly. And you cannot uh, like uh, send a message into secure enclave and then sign it inside because it's only 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 for uh, Apple uh, whitelisted services. Most of them is uh, their own service because they, they need to make sure the security. Uh, the way we use it is uh, maybe it's a little bit too technical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But ba basically it's not, it's, it's, it's in the phone, the key is always in the phone and then yeah. the software is open source and yeah, you have a, 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 yeah, a small server on the back end. Sounds like to do uh, some references or, or some minor computation. Just, but, just to provide the better user experience. Like a, yeah. this token, what is the price? And then those price. I see. Yeah, those price information, of course, you cannot get it from a blockchain directly. Uh, those will require uh, other server uh, to mm -hmm. help you to getting all those information. I see, I see, I see. And for the okay, so enclave, you're just thinking as uh, uh, we use secure enclave to secure your private key. And, and so, so you we, have, uh, you must have released the wallet in 2018, 2019. Did it take you a couple of years to build? In March, in March 2018, that, that is the first version. And it takes, takes us uh, uh, three, three, four months to release the first version. Hmm. That's not bad. Uh, so you release it. There's three of you, I'd imagine, maybe a, a few more working together. You now fast forward to today, you have the wallet in place, and I'm sure there's been some evolution of the wallet, but catch me up on what what else you've been building. I, I assume the wallet is not the only feature or the only yes. product. And also the, 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 other, the other thing is this uh, token squid framework. You can uh, thinking as uh, it's a token interface to connect token with uh, other services. And the first project we utilized both Alpha Wallet and Token Script is uh, back in uh, May 2018. That is a partnership uh, with a FIFA official uh, exclusive ticket agent. So they are handling FIFA's uh, FIFA World Cup tickets for 2018. FIFA, we, the, the yes. soccer? Yes. Oh, awesome. Wow. Yes, so we did the experiment during FIFA World Cup. So we used Ethereum to tokenize 50 real FIFA World Cup tickets. And uh, that year there are 28 real consumer. Uh, they, are, they are not the blockchain uh, investor without any blockchain knowledge. So they use those uh, um, blockchain-based uh, FIFA World Cup tickets actually pass the gate and watch the FIFA World Cup game. So those uh, tickets are non-fungible token. 
uh, uh, NFT, but uh, but uh, it's more much more advanced than the current uh, uh, collectibles. So it's not only not only you can see it as a as a picture as a tickets. More importantly, is uh, those NFT can actually inter interact with the gate. So when user go close to the gate, they are able to transform the NFT into a dynamic QR code. And then the gate is able to read the QR code, uh, verify the, the tickets uh, in the smart contract and mark the tickets, mark the NFT as redeemed. And at the same time, open the, open the door uh, to, uh, to allow the user to pass the gate to uh, actually go into the stadium to watch the FIFA World Cup game. So, so that is the thing I, that, 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 that's why I have to explain all the things in, in before to go to this stage. So this is a, this is an example. So the wallet itself, after you have this uh, uh, FIFA tickets NFT in your wallet, your wallet instantly becomes a ticketing application. So based on this uh, integration point uh, on this uh, token interface, you have the event information. Uh, the, the organizer is able to uh, send notification to you. Uh, you have the integrated map. Where is your seat? Where is the event location? All those things. And also, it itself gave you the interface to interact with the gate. So that means that your, after you have this thing in your wallet, your wallet instantly becomes like a ticketing application. So that's why those uh, 26 uh, uh, non-blockchain experienced user, they are able to just treat the wallet as a ticketing application. And they, they, they just use that thing to pass the gate and watch the FIFA World Cup game. And, and, and the benefit here is, is that the ticketing, because when I think of a ticketing process prior to blockchain, I get the, the ticket on my phone, I get it on a QR code, I go up to the door, they scan it, and I go in. And they might have a little description of the stadium on the app. The advantage here, I would think, is that if I wanted to transfer the ticket to somebody else, they it would solve the double spend problem where, where I couldn't then sell it again, which is a problem in tickets. You know, People sell the same ticket multiple times. Is that the core problem that you would solve with this? Mm -hmm. On one side. That is, uh, that is uh, as I mentioned, there's, uh, there's uh, two features for tokenization. This is for the frictionless market side. So that means uh, by removing the, the trust issue, so you are able, I'm able to buy a ticket from any, any people. Uh, so, so I don't need to really have any trust to that person because the ticket itself uh, can be verified. Right. So that is uh, what, you, what you mentioned is uh, there's no way to double spending the tickets. So no matter where, uh, what kind of channel I got these tickets from, I can always sure that it's a real tickets. Then it uh, can be traded across different platforms, different marketplace. That is, of course, that is uh, one key benefit. And another key benefit is uh, comes from the integration part. So for FIFA, it's a more, a FIFA experiment, it is more like a, a integrate their own services. But we did another, it's, uh, it's not experiment, it's a live, live thing. We did another thing in ticket space in 2019, early 2020. That is a collaboration with UVFA's ticket agent. So we tokenized the 20,000 Euro 2020, the Euro Championship tickets. And for that thing, it's, it, it's, it involves external integration with Booking.com. So Booking.com is the uh, is the is um is the official accommodation provider for Euro two zero two zero, and uh, based on the agreement, they are they are able to secure a lot of uh, accommodation resources in all those uh, European country, uh, uh, at a, at a very good price and the exclusive rights. So that means uh, no other travel agent or no other uh, accommodation provider can do that. But at the same time, they have a condition. They need to provide those accommodation to the real uh, tickets holder. So that okay. means that those accommodation cannot provide it to a non-tickets holder. Then, then it's a uh, cause a problem uh, because uh, 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 
Uvifa cannot integrate it into Booking.com's platform, and Booking.com cannot integrate it to Uvifa's platform. And also for for Uvifa's、uh, ticket distribution channel is multiple layer, so it's not、uh, not fully、uh, integrated. Then there's、uh, almost no way for Booking.com to easily verify who is the real ticket holder. So currently,、mm-hmm. what they do is、uh, is、uh, is just like a Open one eye and close a、uh, close another eyes, so it's just like a、uh, whatever they just、uh, pass all the accommodations to the ticket sales agent and then tell them you cannot give this、uh, offer this hotel to non ticket holder, and then purely depends on what those uh, uh, ticket agents doing, but、uh, so there's no real no real control and no real、uh, user experience for user. And you guys went in there and and just knocked on the door of Booking dot com and said, "Hey, I have an idea." And then,、mm, I, I no, mean, these are big big organizations to work with. No, not really. We work with the the ticket agent, so so they want to do this experiment because they 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 have the control to those、uh, VIP hospitality tickets. Mm-hmm. So we help them to tokenize this twenty、uh, thousand、uh, VIP hospitality tickets, not all the tickets. And then after we tokenize those things, then it's、uh, it enables、uh, Booking dot com to easily integrate、uh, because those things are, are all are all becomes an open API right now.、Mm. And also it can provide like a, a what I call the next level user experience. So now with a with a with a NFT ticket holder, when you go to that special Booking dot com website, you don't need to sign up, you don't need to sign in, you don't need you don't even need to type anything. You don't need to type it's like a a London a hotel. You don't need to select the date. Nothing. You don't you do you do eventually nothing. So you go to the website. You allow the website to read to verify your tickets. Then that's it, because the ticket itself carries enough context for what you may looking for. Ah,、uh, the tickets、uh, have a location, have a have a have date, and it's a verified that、uh, you are the owner. So once you allow the website to read the tickets, it automatically propose you the right travel itinerary. Okay, I got it. So basically, you have、yeah. metadata on chain with the ticket. And you are there's some API or connection or something between the website of Booking dot com and the it's,、um, ticket. It's、um, it's even more advanced than that way. So,、uh, Token Script itself is a、uh, is a is a signed file contains all those uh, uh, information. It's like a interface for for Booking dot com to understand what is this token about. And that file is signed by the ticket issuer to make sure、uh, there's no one can tamper it and it's uh, uh, trustable. It's have the same trust anchor as the actual、uh, blockchain record. The blockchain okay. token. Okay. And is that、and、in the like, browser? So in the if in the browser it recognizes it through a a Chrome extension or. So so that means、uh, you know when you have this、uh, ticket token on the same time. Your your wallet will automatically kind of、uh, download this、uh, file into the wallet for you to use. And when you go to Booking dot com website, what you what you do actually do is、uh, the wallet generate、uh, a testation like a proof, and、uh, give that、uh, proof to Booking dot com, and then Booking dot com is a- only able to read that that verifiable proof, and based on that proof, provide service to you. Got it. So, So that means that Booking dot com is not connected to blockchain at all, and they are not connected to any like a, a server, like a connect to any API. The information they read is provided by user. All the information is provided by user. Got it. Okay. Okay. And so you first built the wallet, then you have the partnership with FIFA, where you have a small group of people test it out in twenty eighteen. Then you go to Booking dot com and then partner with the Euro twenty twenty club or organization, 
and now is that those were still pilot programs to test out the software and get some early customers and u- users mm-hmm. with booking.com and the 2020 thing is uh, is uh, is died because of the covid-19 oh yeah so we That's have true. all those uh, we have all those uh, tickets ready uh, on ethereum blockchain but after all they they they, they didn't do that and we even have a customized uh, uh, ticket application that is a valuable version of Alpha Wallet uh, live in the in the App Store and the Play Store. But after all, the, the whole project got uh, got got uh, uh, got cancelled because they keep delaying, delaying and uh, delaying, and uh, they they are not able to facilitate that amount of uh, people. So so no. Yeah. I see. Okay, so the company you you raised. Looks like about two two point three million uh, did these programs with the ticketing, and then there was obviously COVID, and there's you know a pause in in person events. At that point, did you shift gears? Now I, I'm curious to see had you been focusing on Alpha Wallet the whole time, or is this where Alchemy NFT comes into place after the events were paused? No, not really. Because uh, and also tickets is not only it's it's just one of the uh, the tokenization project or the use case we did in the past four years. There's also many other things. Even in the ticketing space, is uh, the latest uh, ticket project we did is for Ethereum Foundation. That is for the next uh, DevCon uh, events, and that is a more comprehensive, much advanced solution. So besides the ticketing, we also did uh, like a car ownership token. That is mm. a collaboration with uh, Karma Automobile, a US-based electronic car company. And that same, uh, that same uh, uh, proof of concept, we, we, we did it again, but that is an internal proof of concept and we cannot disclose the company name, but they are the one of the largest uh, uh, automobile uh, business from Japan. Because they see what we did with Karma, and they want to do an internal proof of concept to evaluate uh, all these uh, uh, possibilities. So that thing is uh, also quite interesting. So after you tokenize the car ownership, uh, that as I mentioned, that serves as an integration point. Not only you can easily transfer, sell, use it as a collateral to participate in DeFi. Not only those things. More importantly, you can integrate all other services, uh, like the insurance company. Uh, say when you go to an insurance website, no need to sign up, no need to sign in, no need to select work which car, no need to upload all those uh, uh, PDF or physical documents because everything, all the contact is there. Uh, you I see. A lot of, of websites to read it, and then yeah. with one click, you get your insurance policy. Uh, and also, yeah. we, that makes uh, a lot of sense to me. I mean, I, I think cars are a great use case because there's so much data that you want included in the car, uh, in the car, in the car's metadata. And there's also, it's important to understand who owns it. So unlike, you know, if I sell you my headphones, it's such a low value item. Um, but it's still valuable. Even just for your cell, your cell phone, uh, just for that case, it is, it is still valuable to tokenize uh, uh, that rights. Right, right. As and I so how many... They are fundamental uh-huh. value, like uh, increase the liquidity uh, through frictionless market and then increase the utility. So that means uh, if there is uh, one more third-party services want to provide service to you based on this tokenized wise, then you can consider that as an additional utility uh, to your original token. And maybe there's two, maybe there's three, there's unlimited possibilities. You, you never know. For example, you own a second-hand mobile phone. This is a tradable rights. And uh, this rights may be valuable for many other third-party service providers. For example, maybe an insurance company is interested. Uh, maybe an a, 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 a accessory company is interested to provide service to you. So they can all provide service to you based on this uh, piece of uh, verifiable information. And then they can all become, you can all think in them as the utility of your token. So it's kind of like uh, can adding unlimited utilities to your token. 
uh, and this will increase the base value of this uh, tradable rights itself. So no matter it's a big thing or small thing, complex thing or very simple thing, as long as you tokenize it, it will add certain value. Uh, it will add certain benefits. Mm. And how many cars now are using this tokenization through your I don't know, no, there's uh, nothing on live on the market. It's a, it's a, it's a proof of concept. So we also I need see. to create the physical car itself. So and, once now, you, hmm. Hmm. and is this now through Alchemy NFT? So the site alchemynft.org, you have a lot of, uh, you have description of um, NFTs bringing a new layer of liquidity and utility. It, it, this is another uh, project. I mean, I'll use the word project, but it's separate from, it's owned under the same umbrella as uh, Alpha Alpha Wallet. What was the it, the purpose for creating Alchemy NFT was to yeah. launch these kind of projects with you know yeah. cars. So, that that the, the main reason is that we date the modern thirty this type of uh, tokenization project like car tickets, uh, people's time advertisement board redeemable voucher gift card membership card all those mm. things. And um, and the majority of them are NFT related. And this, yeah. I was going to ask you, as the CEO, how do you? There's it seems like there's so many different directions you can go with this technology. You can go in cars or gift cards or you know sporting events. And a lot of these take a lot of time. You know, to partner with the FIFA or Booking.com, I'm sure requires calls and you have to explain things and contracts and. Uh, how do you how do you decide which direction to to spend your time and to to go with the project? The the direction is always same. So what 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 mm-hmm. whatever use case we are building, that is a key thing. Is uh, we want to demonstrate our technology, and the second thing is uh, on the same time, uh, we want to improve our technology. So that means uh, when we're doing a project with uh, those uh, business partners, if it's just just like a repeating what we already did, then we won't do it. We also source those things to third-party service provider, those are tech partners. They help us using our technology to build solution for those companies, and we get a cut. But the the, the thing we we do it by ourselves is always for this use case. Okay, it will use one of the new component we we plan to develop for our technology, but we haven't deployed yet. And then we use the opportunity uh, for, uh, for, for doing this uh, business project together to develop our own technology. Because uh, Alpha Wallet and the token script, if we, if we say how many percent is uh, complete, maybe Alpha Wallet is uh, 20% for now, compared with what we wanted to mm-hmm. have. And token script is like uh, maybe only 10%, even after four years. Hmm. So those those things, there's uh, so many things need to be uh, developed for this uh, two technology, and uh, and we don't want to just uh, sit there, close the door, and uh, based on imagination to develop these two uh, core pieces of technology. It need to be get involved with uh, the people who actually using those technology to to collect feedback, to understand the business logic, to see which part we will need to improve. So, so that means the goal never changed. It's not like we want to become a ticketing company. No, we are not interested, and we are not interested to become a car company as well. So, right, right. I, I, yeah, I'm more uh, highlighting the fact that there are many different projects to go after, and yes. you know, I imagine you sit down in the morning and you say, "Okay, well, where can our technology be used?" And you think maybe cars or ticketing or gift cards, and then you have to send emails to marketing directors and teams and you know spend time going down different directions. The company is funded through the two and a half million you raised to investors. You mentioned the other lines of revenue. Is that are there anything that is anything that you've learned from running a, a, a crypto comp- blockchain company that in terms of funding the team? Like there's many different ways to do it. You could do, you could raise money in the traditional way through investors, uh, give away ownership in the company. You could do, uh, you know, 
ICOs, you know, create a coin. You could do freelance work where you're working in exchange for money. You could license out the technology. Um, there may be others. I'm curious, have, have you, what have you learned in terms of uh, keeping, keeping everyone getting paid, you know, like on a financial side of the business? Um, yeah. I, so before, before the, uh, actually in, in, in early 2020, we already profitable business. So the revenue is mainly comes from uh, those uh, partnership. And there's uh, almost uh, no cost on the acquisition of those uh, uh, customers. We, we, even for now, we still receiving like uh, five to six incoming uh, business inquiries every day on a, on a daily basis asking for whether we can help them to tokenize this, to tokenize that, or whether they can fork off a wallet to do this, to do that, whether we can provide some tech support, some consulting services, all those things. So so we don't... Actually, before we, we start the Alchemy FT project, we don't even have uh, people, uh, uh, delegate people working on marketing, PR, sales, Gross, no, it's just just myself with a bunch of uh, engineer. Uh, so, yeah, and in terms of uh, um, how to how to how to do those uh, fundraising related thing, actually, I consider ourselves as a very bad example. Not not very bad, but maybe people have a different choice. Yes, um. When we when we when we started, at least for the first uh, two to three years, we are kind of um, not not kind of uh, don't like those uh, ICOs because uh, most of them is uh, issuing some uh, useless token, right? And uh, the token is not representing the actual rights which is a bond with the project itself. So that means right. it's purely based on a, um, purely based on like a verbal verbal guarantee. So that means that if my if my project is good then then later you will be able to get a cut through those tokens. Uh, and yeah there's no real utility or real bond with the business. Right. It's right. even worse. It's even worse than a share, because there's no re- legal responsibility for the token issuer to, to, to give investors anything in return. Right, right. And so, do you think that everything that happened in 2017, 2018, when the ICO boom happened, was that just? Um, you don't think that'll happen again because people now realize that the way that the mechanics are structured between the investors and the company, like you said, it, they don't have any, it's, it's built on their word as opposed to any contract or. So, so, so after, after, after that stage, then there's uh, comes up a lot of uh, different type of uh, ICO token. Some of them uh, use it as a, like a transaction fee. Uh, some of them use it uh, as a, Kind of like uh, you stake it in my protocol, and then you get certain privilege. You are able to do something, and uh, some of them uh, use it as a kind of like a, a security. Uh, that that means if uh, they use their own token to back up their their protocol for something as a like an insurance, like an insurance mm-hmm. pool. Yeah. So so then there's a uh, multiple ways to really get token involved with the project itself. And some of them is uh, called the governance token. It's basically just share, but they, 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 they cannot call it as share because if they call it as share, then it's security. Right, no, no right. Trouble. But fundamentally, the, the purpose is the same. With share, you are able to vote, you are able to get dividend. And with those governance token, yes, you are able to vote. And normally they reserve the, the dividend part. Uh, they, they hide it. But a lot of projects, they have a treasury pool. So they collect those uh, uh, protocol fees in a treasury pool. And then all the people who have voting rights can decide how to use those money. Uh, right. they, can, they, they, can, they can 
they can distribute it to all the token holder or they can use it as investment or, or for any purpose. So it's very similar to share. So, so, so when I say it's a, it's a mistake, that is, that is um, we, at the beginning, we don't like it uh, for, for the first uh, two or three years uh, because we see most of them is, uh, don't have these kind of uh, functions. But right now, after it's uh, growing to the current stage, uh, there are a lot of uh, successful and uh, real working token project. Mm. Wh- which one? Which projects are you most inspired by? And have uh, maybe the, the the on different thing. For example, on the governance side, uh, governance token utility side, I think uh, uh, MakerDAO is a very good example. Mm. Um, they starting with a as, as a company, the organization, and right now it's uh, kind of uh, almost fully decentralized. So there's uh, no more no more company, no more employees or those things. Everything is organized through the DAO, and the people who holding their maker token is uh, participate uh, uh, quite actively uh, in the in the in the DAO, and also MKR itself serves as a, a kind of like an additional insurance layer for the maker protocol what was the name of that uh maker dot mk m-a-k-e-r and you're saying uh there's an insurance layer layer for that uh they use uh, they kind of uh, use the maker dot token the mkr token as a as an additional insurance layer to protect the maker dot protocol for i see from a very 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 bad situation so for example if uh if the ETH dropped uh, like a fifty percent in one hour, then then it's already over the uh, most of the collateralized ratio. Then that means the the underlayer collateralized asset is is not even uh it cannot cannot cover the uh, die they are issuing. Then what they do is that they will they will use uh, some of the uh, M- MKR. MKR token sell to the uh, open market and use that money to top up. So that is kind of uh, serves as an additional layer of uh, insurance of the protocol. Mm, I see. So if you were to hold, say, say you had a hundred thousand US dollars and you wanted to put it in a stable coin, are you choosing uh, DAO? Are you, are you choosing Tether? How, uh, do you, do you see them as all being equal? Um. <laughs> so, so they they sell for different purpose. But, Say but you just then, wanted to hold it. You just wanted to hold it and put it in. You know, put it in a in a wallet. No, I mean for for example, USDT. I I, I use the uh, Dai USDT and USDC on the same time, but uh, but but in different scenario. Uh, for uh, USDT previously is the most uh, uh, adopted uh, stablecoin. So that means uh, I'm able to use it uh, across all the exchanges, uh, all the platforms, all the people recognize it. But right now it's, uh, it's almost, uh, uh, on that side, it's almost the same as the USDC. But previously, if I want to do some uh, quick transfer or move money between different platforms, the, the first choice is USDT. And when I say quick, that is important. So that means I'm not going to hold USDT in my wallet. It just mm-hmm. serves as an intermediary. I move it and then I leave it. Uh, but uh, uh, for USDC, when I use it, it's mainly for me to do fiat on RAM and off RAM because they are regulated and uh, I have a higher uh, uh, KYC account. So I'm able to move uh, like a, a 500,000 between fiat and USDC on a weekly basis. I see. I see. And in terms of that, that is, uh, I, I don't know whether we should <laughs> we should say it in the to the public. It's like a uh, you 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 have some uh, asset and uh, you don't you don't want it to be regulated by any country, you know? And I just I just uh, want to hold it, and I don't want them uh, to be to be to. Uh, to have any control over my asset, mm. and uh, and on the same time, I, I may thinking I may do a little bit of hedge on ETH. So that means I, I want to 
certain part of my eyesight is in stable coin. Mm. So even <laughs> what I do is a uh, is a uh, like a brand new no connection wallet. Uh, that is uh, holding some of my die. Uh, mm. That means uh, no one can, no one can touch it. No one can regulate it. But for USDC is another story. For for the USDC wallet, for my wallet related to USDC, it's always uh, like a KYC. That means the right. exchange know who I am. The the USDC know who I am. It's a uh, it's very regulated. I pay tax. Everything is is super clear. Well, right, right, right. And for different purposes. That's a good explanation. Yeah. So Tether being the first, the initially the largest and the fastest USDC being regulated. So good for on-ramp and off-ramp and then DAI uh, being good for uh, keeping it more anonymous and away from regulation. In, in yeah. China, um, you went to school and lived in China for a, a long period of time. You're now uh, not in China. Do you view are are stable coins very popular in China? Do you have any insight as to that, or not so yeah. much? Maybe anecdotally. No, it's uh, it's very popular. Very popular, yeah, no, yeah. It, it, it's popular for 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 many reasons. No? Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a different relationship in China with the citizens and their money and the Chinese government than there is in other parts of the world. I think in the U S people, they don't want the government to, uh, there's not a big concern of the government taking their money or directly shutting their accounts down. I think in many ways, people look at the government as a sense of security uh, with the FDIC insure insurance People look at the value of the government being if the bank were to go out of business or disappear, then the government's going to have my back. On the flip side, the government controls the money flow. So they're, you know, they, get, they can print off $6 trillion and create inflation. Uh, they can also, in the US, they can track your flow of funds. And that presumably is not good if you're trying to um, remain anonymous. Uh, but there seems to be a different philosophy that the Chinese government has with respect to the cryptocurrency, which is kind of re rejecting it and it's it making creating their own. Um, I, I don't know. I know that they've gone as far as to say that mining is not allowed. Has there been any recent news on China's policy towards crypto? I I don't see any yeah. any recent news, but it can change mm. like a. Today no news, tomorrow can totally yeah. change. That is the that is the biggest problem. And there's mm. no consistency and the people feel have those uncertainty. And and generally the rule now is it, or tell me where I'm wrong, but the rule is you can't uh, are you allowed to buy and sell and trade freely or where do they where does the government currently draw you, the line in the sand? You are, you are allowed to hold those uh, uh, currencies, yeah. so and also it is uh, kind of uh, protected by law because it's uh, treated as a virtual uh, asset. Uh, so you definitely you uh, at least for now you holding it is uh, is okay. They allowed you to hold it, but you are not allowed to do like a uh, uh, provide services like uh, you provide OTC service, you provide exchange mm -hmm. service. No, that is uh, not uh, not allowed. Uh, they have the mm -hmm. clear rule, although it is uh, not uh, not a law, but uh, but sometimes the 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 policy, the rules is even powerful than the law. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, so you can still hold it, but you cannot do any business related to it. You cannot provide services. You can't provide services. So would it be true to say that your so technically what you would be doing would not be categorized as legal? Where you're providing yeah. services for, yeah, and yeah. was that the re was that the reason you left because it was ruled as being? I left a long time ago. I start my, I got my bachelor degree in uh, double E, uh, in China, and mm. after that I I got my master degree in IT, in Australia, and after after study I just uh, uh, most of the time is living in Australia. Uh, mm. But I did live in Singapore on and off, like uh, five, maybe five years. 
Mm. But majority of the time is uh, in Australia. Nice. I used to live in Singapore too, uh, a while ago, but <laughs> great place. It's a nice and um, kind of a kind of boring place. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. But it's great because you can go to other countries very easily. Yes. That is the that is the key benefit. Is connect yeah. to all the places, but at yeah. the same time, it's um, for 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 Stormbird. Why we decide to do it in Singapore? One of the key reason is that we see there are so many news. They said this company is blockchain company is in Singapore. That company is in Singapore. Then we think it's a it's a good place, uh, and then after we move, we we found out. Most of the people just put their like a sales, BD, PR marketing in Singapore, and the developer, the the brain, the 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 founder, they are not actually in Singapore. They just register a company there and leave someone to to do the show in Singapore, but the actually people who do the work are not there. Interesting, interesting, huh? So and also the 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 people, the. The startup environment there is uh, is is weird. It's like the government is uh, trying to encourage their own people to be more brave to do startup to do innovation, mm -hmm. and they gave a lot of grant trying to encourage all those things. But uh, but but at the same time, they are growing up in an environment. Everything is a uh, is a uh, very much controlled. You can't do this. Yeah. Do that. Everyone is following the rules. So they grow up in that mindset. So and then and then the government encourage you to do all those adventure. So it's kind of against each other. Yeah. That's why, yeah. That's why in Singapore there's uh, so many very talented, like a developer, engineer, all those people, but they are very afraid of uh, working in the startup. We yeah. So many those uh, those very talented people. They really just uh, want to work for Google. Like a Facebook got the two hundred thousand a year yeah. something like that compared with working <laughs> for a startup. Even if we want to pay the same salary, they just yeah. don't feel comfortable. Yeah, I can see that culture being true. The emphasis on go, go do, go be adventurous, go start a company, but make sure it's not something you know we don't like. And uh, I can see that being a bit of a a conflict of a message. Uh, well, Victor, I, I want to thank you for coming on today. Congrats on all the progress with uh, Alpha Wallet and the Alchemy NFT and all the projects that you're doing. Please keep me in the loop with everything that you're doing. And um, you know, I wish you guys all the best of luck and you know, keep being persistent and stick with it. Like you said, it's inevitable. So it sounds like you guys are the right team to make it happen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. All right.